Welcome to this special forum at the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Courtney Diorio and I'm the president of the City Club. Very pleased to welcome you all here today. Today's program is the result of a collaboration with Policy Bridge and the Cleveland chapter of the National Black MBA Association. I am pleased to introduce the co-founder of Policy Bridge and the director of community affairs for RPM International, Mr. Randall McShepard. Randall is a highly regarded leader on the civic front. Among his many roles, <laughs> he is a director of the City Club's Forum Foundation Board and is supportive of the City Club in many ways. I promised him I would keep it brief. I will now turn it over to Randy, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Just like we rehearsed it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Directors of Policy Bridge, an African-American think tank, and the Cleveland chapter of the National Black MBA Association, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's program. Many of you are here because you care about a few of what I call the serious issues that affect and or impact quality of life here in Northeast Ohio, as well as throughout the nation. Those issues include civil rights, politics, culture, race, and leadership. Although we could easily bring in five distinguished lecturers to offer perspectives on each of these areas, we are blessed today to have one individual that has a keen understanding of and a rich experience with each of these topics. That individual is Juan Williams. Juan is one of America's leading political writers and thinkers. He is the senior correspondent for National Public Radio, where he has also hosted America's Black Forum and Talk of the Nation. He is a political analyst for Fox Television and a regular panelist for Fox News Sunday. As one of the nation's most influential journalists, Williams is in constant contact with American political leaders, from the president, to members of Congress, to the Supreme Court. His understanding of American history and his inside access to Washington politics gives him a unique and informed voice as an analyst of current events. In addition to prize-winning columns and editorial writing for the Washington Post for over 20 years, he has authored six books, which include one of my favorites, Eyes on the Prize, My Soul Looks Back in Wonder, Thurgood Marshall, American Revolutionary, and his newest book, which is on sale today if you don't have it yet, titled Enough, The Phony Leaders, Dead End Movements, and Culture of Failure That Are Undermining Black America, and What We Can Do About It. Through this book, Mr. Williams has created a national furor and ignited intense debate everywhere with his point-blank analysis of black leadership in this country. I want you to know, Juan, you're safe today. This is a citadel of free speech. <laughs> but his bio says that he combines a bold, perceptive, solution-based look at African-American life culture, and politics with an impassioned clarion call to do the right thing now while not losing sight of the true values of the civil rights movement. I say that his book challenges each of us to look introspectively at our values, beliefs, and priorities as they relate to leadership and change. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, you should know that Juan is one of the nicest and most humble men I think I've ever met. And uh, you should know that he made several concessions to be with us today, and for that we are very grateful. So without further ado, let's not give any welcome. Let's give a Cleveland welcome to Mr. Juan Williams. Thank you, Juan. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for all these introductions. You know, I have so many people here that I've known as a reporter over the years, people who are friends, it's just great to be with all of you. And I must say, it's, uh, some people are saying outside that it's nice to put a face with the voice that they hear on NPR and all that. So thanks for listening to National Public Radio. 
you know, in those situations, I always have to restrain myself, I'll tell you the truth, because the fact is, it might be nice for you to put a face with the voice, but I didn't know what you looked like either, so <laughs> surprise to me. And it's also nice to be in Cleveland, because, you know, you actually have less snow than we do back in D.C. Over the weekend, we got hit pretty hard. It was beautiful. The trees were just lined with snow, but it was cold. It was seriously cold. I was up on Capitol Hill. It was so cold, the politicians were walking around with their hands in their own pockets. It was that cold. <laughs> it was freezing. I'll tell you. Yeah. So, it's that kind of cold. And then, I, and then last night, again, you know, what a Cleveland welcome. I got put up at the Ritz. Man, this was great. I was saying to Randy this morning, I don't know how I'm going to check out. I mean, the towels are so fluffy. I don't know how I'm going to close my suitcase. <laughs> it's impossible. So this is, this is really a great time to visit Cleveland. You know, I come, I come here. Today is the last day of the month. And uh, tomorrow is a new month. The Indians are already in spring training. I understand Barack Obama was here. New generation of leadership is coming on the scene. You stop and think about this day, this time of year, as a real time of change, a time of change for us all. And I wanted to speak to you at the City Club today about change and about the idea that here we are, more than 50 years after Brown, this year is 50 years after Little Rock and the crisis, and Central High School that you'll remember. This is truly, it seems to me, a time for change. There's so much change taking place in America. Sometimes it just washes over us. We don't always appreciate it. For example, in the world that I live in, we have seen change recently on Capitol Hill. The Democrats taking control of both the House and the Senate. You go back, it's not even 10 years, we've seen a president impeached. Goodness gracious, we've been through two highly controversial elections. You folks here in Ohio know about close elections and about determining outcomes. You come forward in that time, we've seen the horrors of 9-11. We've seen America go to war in Afghanistan and in Iraq. We've seen just in the last year two new members put on the Supreme Court. All of that political change in such a short period of time. And then, of course, there's demographic change. The Census Bureau announced the other day we have now 300 million people living in this country. What was really shocking about the announcement was not that we're such a big population, but that they said it's only going to be another 20 years or so before we're 400 million Americans. Think about that rate of growth. It's unbelievable. Think about the opportunity implicit. Think about the risk. And, of course, much of that immigration change in population comes from immigration. And you know about the arguments we've been having in Washington about both legal and illegal immigration. And you stop and think about the immigrants that came here a century ago. They were people coming from Germany, from Ireland, from Italy. They were populating big cities up and down the East Coast, hoping to move out west to come toward Cleveland for opportunity. Now we have people who are coming from Asia, from Mexico, the Caribbean, Latin America, coming from Africa, coming from the newly independent republics of the former Soviet Union. They come here as hyphenated Americans, as part of a global economic structure. They might come for education or health care or for a job, but they may intend to go back home. They retain their language, their ethnic identity. You know, the uh, demographers used to talk about America as a melting pot. No, not today. Today they talk about the mosaic. Or they talk about, uh, given it's lunchtime, they talk about the salad bowl. You know, a salad bowl where you got the lettuce and the tomato and the onions all retaining their distinct identities, even as they're working together to make that nutritious salad. Here at the City Club, you might think of me as some kind of fuzzy-headed carrot standing up here today. <laughs> and if you really know me, you know I'm always on the lookout for cute tomatoes, so <laughs> keep that in mind. So you have to, this is new analogy, this big salad bowl we're all in. Well, that's a different kind of America. That's a different, that's a challenge to an American identity when people, you know, come and go, opportunities come and go. And of course, you know about this being a different time, a time of change with regard to our economy. Goodness gracious, right here in Cleveland, you know about economic change, about a change from 
an industrial base. We've gone through so many changes in the American economy over the last hundred years. We went from an agricultural base to an industrial base, a service-based economy, information-based economy, high-tech economy. Now they say that we're really engaged in what they call the, a biotech economy, where you're going to have human genome mapping leading you to all sorts of new inventions, innovations in terms of medicine and chemistry and biology. My goodness, you know, to make this real to you, you know, they've got pills today that will put hair on your head. They've got pills that will lower your cholesterol. I see we've got a mixed audience, but if we didn't, I'd tell you, they've got pills that will do amazing things today. <laughs> we've, got, we've got some young people, young people watching us. But let me, let, me, let me just say that if this speech were to last longer than four hours, you should seek immediate <laughs> medical attention. Yes, it's true. So in that kind of economy, you've got to be at the forefront in terms of education to, in order to participate in that kind of economic adventure. So we see all kinds of changes all around us. But there's a question, what about change when it comes to our discussion, our understanding of race relations in this picture? What is happening in terms of civil rights and opportunity? Where's the change in that regard? Where's the new leadership? Where's the generational change that would give new energy to long-held discussions about racial equality and opportunity in American society? Well, you know, I think there's time for every idea. You go back in time, you think of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass who was born in slavery, who had to teach himself how to read to escape slavery, and then went on to be a great editor, orator, a man who convinced President Lincoln to allow black people to wear the uniform of the Union Army and Navy so that they could fight for their own freedom. You stop and think about that kind of tradition and his slave narratives that moved so many souls. That was his time. You come forward to the likes of Booker T. Washington, more leadership on display, his book Up From Slavery, a man who was talking about love of education, even creating schools on wagon wheels if necessary, people using talents and skills that they gained during days of slavery, craftsmen, workers, in order to develop an economic base in the black community. That's Booker T. Washington. Then you hear about Du Bois, Du Bois writing about the souls of black folk, talking about the need to develop a talented tenth to educate young people so that they can be leaders in our community. And then again, you come forward and you come to the likes of Ralph Ellison writing about Invisible Man. You come to people writing about our native son. You come to people like Malcolm X and his biography talking about how you make it in modern America even if you've been in jail, that you can educate yourself, build your family, love your community, be proud to be black in America. You come to Dr. King talking about where do we go from here? There's all this epics of change over time. And now we come again to another moment at the start of the 21st century where we have to have an honest conversation about the need for change in leadership and ideas with regard to civil rights and freedom. I think of Dr. King, Dr. King who would have been 78 years old this January. Next year he would have been gone from us 40 years. Without a doubt, Dr. King would have been an advocate of change. But I want to ask you this afternoon about your reaction if Dr. King walked in those doors, the living Dr. King. And the living Dr. King says, I've come back to Cleveland because I want to know about change. I want to know where we are today, 40 years after I left the scene. Has there been a change? And let's say that the living Dr. King decided to sit with you at your table, wanted to know what was going on in Cleveland. How are we doing? Maybe he would start by asking about the black family. Say the black families carried us through so many times of change. I want to make sure that our black children 
that our black families are in good shape. How's the black family? What would you say to Dr. King? You say, well, Dr. King, we have a lot of divorce all through America, all groups, a lot of divorce. Sad to say, but about 25% of the white kids are born out of wedlock today, about 50% of the Hispanic children. But when it comes to our black children, it's 70%, Dr. King, and we're so sad about that, but it creates lots of problems for the schools, for the social safety net in the community, even for the police, you know, because somebody's got to bring up those kids. It's a problem. And Dr. King says, well, well what, about, what about the schools? You talk about our young people. What about the schools? How are the schools doing? I say, oh, my goodness, Dr. King. Well, the schools are struggling. You know, we care so much about it. We've got all sorts of reform plans. There's all sorts of arguments. The, the president has a no child left behind plan. Lots of people are discussing things like vouchers and charter schools and magnet schools. We're trying our best, uh, but we really have struggled, especially in big cities like Cleveland, with education. And so uh, we're working on that. And, and maybe the, the most troubling part is we have now a 50% dropout rate among our black and Hispanic kids in schools. And he says, in 2007, with global economic competition, such a high dropout rate from high school? I say, well, sorry to say that, Dr. King, but that's, a, that's the truth. He says, well, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, he says to you. We talked about the family. We talked about the schools. What about, what about poverty? You know, that I, when I was killed in Memphis, the, if I hadn't been killed, or I was going on to Washington because I wanted to lead a poor people's campaign. I wanted to show people in Washington we still had need and poverty in our country. How are we doing with poverty right now? He said, well, Dr. King, it's about 12% poverty rate in America as we speak. It's been going up over the last few years. It's really upsetting because when you stop and think about it, it's about a 25% poverty rate in black America. 25%, says Dr. King. And you say, oh, yeah, well, it's 25%, and, and we're struggling with it, and Sometimes that poverty is attached to homelessness and so much need. Dr. King says, well, what about the prisons? Have we dealt with the prison issue in this country? You say, oh, my goodness, Dr. King. You say, well, if you went to visit our jails, you'd see that 60% of the faces are made up of black and Hispanic people in our prisons today. He says, well, what's the population? You say, well, Dr. King, it's very interesting. In fact, you know, his, there are more Hispanics than African Americans in the country, so they're the major minority now. But in terms of the overall population, they make up maybe 27, 28 percent of the population, but it's 60 percent of the prison population. And at this point, having delivered all this news to this elderly Dr. King, you might say, you know what, Dr. King, sit here. Let me, let me take you outside for a minute. I want you to just, just sit here and watch some TV. We're going to get it together in the room, and you can come back. So Dr. King goes outside, and Dr. King flips on the TV. And he flips on the TV, and the first thing that comes on is MTV. And he sees there Flavor of Love. <laughs> he says, oh my god, what is this? He says, I didn't know they had a KKK channel now. What is going on? They've got a black man in a large hat with a big clock around his neck and grill on his teeth, and he's acting the fool, and he's got making insulting remarks about these black women, and they've, they're clamoring for his attention. What is this? This is horrible. He says, I'm not watching this foolishness. And you know, he's an old man. He doesn't know about the channel changer, so he gets up, <laughs> and he changes the channel. He changes the channel, and now he comes to BET. He says, well, this has got to be better. This is black entertainment television. But what he sees is images of black people, especially young black men, as gangsters, as criminals, as thugs. They've got a lot of attitude in order to have presence. They've got to have a sense of violence or threat about them. They've got to have a gun or a knife or bling around their neck. The young women are dressed like hookers, and they're dancing and gyrating. He says, what is this? This is unbelievable. He, again, he changes the channel. And now he comes to Comedy Central. And there's a lot of comedians using the N-word. He thinks, what is, what is, this is horrible. This is the new century. This is the image of black people. And then he sees uh, Dave Chappelle. He says, he sees this a tape show. He says, I wonder why this show's taped. Why is this an old show? He doesn't know that Dave Chappelle stopped doing the show, returned the $50 million, because he said, you know what? 
I can see that people thought I was supposed to be doing satire, but now I see people are laughing at me and at stereotypes of black people rather than understanding that I'm trying to skewer these stereotypes. So he had stopped doing it. Dr. King now says, this is too much. He flips the channel one more time. Now he comes to the news. And the news is about black people killing black people at record rates, drive-by shootings, drug He said, this is unbelievable. Then he comes to Oprah Winfrey. She's taken $40 million, gone over to South Africa to help with education. He's thinking to himself, now why would she take this child of Mississippi, why would she take her money from America when I've just heard these people talk about the educational problems here and gone to South Africa? But then Oprah Winfrey is asked by a reporter and she says, well, goodness gracious, when I visit schools in the United States, the kids want iPods and sneakers and fancy clothes, but when I go over to South Africa, they're talking about can we get books, can we get schools, can we learn to be leaders? And I decided that's where I wanted to put my money. And then here comes a story about Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby's talking about problems in the black community, and people are saying Bill Cosby is blaming the victim. He's just a comedian. He doesn't understand what's going on with racism in this society. He's airing dirty laundry. And Bill Cosby, Bill Cosby, who's given tens of millions of dollars to historically black colleges and universities, who's made himself available for every good cause in the black community, is now being lambasted as a self-hating black man. Dr. King is just totally puzzled. And you go back outside, you say, how'd you enjoy TV, Dr. King? <laughs> this is what's going on in America. And Dr. King says, well, you know, I didn't enjoy it much. Turn that foolishness off. I'm glad you still have an off button. He says, but what about leadership? What about black leadership today? Because you've got a much more diverse country from what I understand. There's more Hispanics, more Asians. You've got people from all over the world coming to America. You can't still be having the same old arguments about race going back to the 1950s and 60s when I left you. So tell me about leadership. And where is the leadership taking us today? And you say, well, Dr. King, you know, Dr. King, you spoke about the civil rights movement's greatest glory as being that black people stood tall, that black people organized, strategized, built coalitions, that we touched the conscience of a nation in order to confront a segregationist culture and the laws of segregation and promote social change. It is celebrated today as the greatest social movement America has ever seen, and black leadership was at the forefront of that movement. But today, Dr. King, we have leadership that will show up when there's a police shooting. They'll capture the TV camera in an instant, grab a microphone. But in terms of talking about the strength of the black community, or the power or the genius of blacks in terms of science, in terms of medicine, in terms of business. No, uh, there's oftentimes now an emphasis on grievance, Dr. King, on a victim mentality. In order to be really black, you got to be of somebody's victim. And there's not an emphasis on people standing tall. And so the leadership is really struggling. And most of all, you know, it's just, so shameful, Dr. King, but there's no sense in which we're passing on the torch. You know how, Dr. King, you worked with Andrew Young. You worked with Jesse Jackson. You worked with Ralph. You worked with other people, and you encouraged younger people to come and make their way in the great tradition of social uplift and self-determination that are the hallmarks of black leadership. You encouraged a new generation. Well, the new generation today, Dr. King, is still waiting. Because so many of the leaders that have been in place have cut deals. You know, we had all the political developments in the 70s, black mayors, black elected officials, and everybody's got their own deal, their own little turf. Everybody's so protective of that turf. And so when the younger people come along, they're seen as threatening the existing deals. And a lot of new ideas or new energy may come in the room, but people are like, well, exactly. Who are you? And did you march with Dr. King? And where are your credentials? In fact, we've even got a young man just in Cleveland the other day, Barack Obama, 
If he was standing on the curb, you'd say there's a young black man, but we've got people in the older civil rights leadership who say, nah, he's not black. He's not really black. Uh, you know, what kind of black man is he? And where'd he come from? And who is he? And they don't want to embrace him even to the point of a willingness to get to know him. So you can imagine if you're not Barack Obama, the kind of reception you're getting as a young leader in America today. So Dr. King says, well, this is a hell of a situation you got here. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And Dr. King says, you know, you might be waiting for the next Dr. King. You might be waiting for the next great social program. But I think, I think he says, you have got to, in this day and age, understand that you can be a reactionary. You can react to so much change that's taking place in America. You can be a, a manager of change and say, well, change has occurred, and this is how we're going to have to manage it. We're trying not to be reactionary or threatened or scared. We can manage change. He says, but you know, the best leadership comes from people who create change, create positive change, put their hands in the muck and mire of American life and sculpt, shape what is to come. That's the hallmark of black leadership and of the best leadership of all colors. And he says, we're looking, as I look out now on Cleveland and the United States today in this new century, he says, I want to see leadership of that kind of that spirit. And I think it would be a challenge to all of us in the room to understand that we have got to encourage a spirit of full debate, a spirit of leadership that is not threatened easily, but in fact, it celebrates young people coming along and tries to give them a leg up and says, you know what, we want to encourage you because we understand that as you become a leader, you lift us up as well. And I go higher if there are younger people coming along in my field. And if I've mentored them, they may even have a debt to me. And they may want to, in fact, enrich me. So there's all kinds of good things that comes from lending a hand. And instead of attacking people, cutting them off at the knees, telling them that they didn't march or that they don't understand, why not give them a moment of time and an opportunity to distinguish themselves so that we can say, you know what, we truly did pass the baton on to a new generation of leaders who can hold it tall, who can hold that torch high, and who can again distinguish us in this time, a time when we have such amazing economic challenges, at a time when we have such amazing educational challenges, at a time when we have cultural challenges, that we can say there's new leadership coming along, and we don't have to worry about being graying revolutionaries. In fact, we can say those young leaders are going to celebrate us. Stop romanticizing the 50s and 60s and start talking about what's happening right now today. You know, a lot of times people say to me, Juan, why would you call a book about the civil rights movement Eyes on the Prize? And I tell them it comes from an old gospel song. By the way, the, whenever people ask me that question, I know they don't go to church very often. <laughs> but once I get beyond that, I say, you know, the words really come from the verse, which has to do with the idea that you should persevere, that, you know, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. I know the one thing I did right was the day I started to fight, hold on. And what I'm saying to all of you this afternoon is that you have to understand that you're in a fight. And with regard to young leaders in our community, there are people who would slip those young leaders sleeping pills, who would tell them, hey, you can't make a difference. It's too hard. We tried before, didn't work. Just celebrate the past. Just say nice things. We'll have Black History Month. We'll have a King holiday. We'll go through the motions. But when it comes to making it real, oh, you know what? You might step on somebody's toe. You might make somebody uncomfortable. Well, guess what? You're in a fight. You should expect to get punched in the face. And you should expect to have to get up and prove yourself again, because that is the great tradition of black leadership, overcoming difficulty, being there when people don't want you there.
And with regard to our young people, we've got to speak against that dysfunctional culture that comes through the television and through the movies and tell them, you know what, we love you. And we expect the best of you. We have high expectations. And we know that you're born leaders. And don't you ever, ever let the TV or anybody else tell you that you can't learn, that you can't excel, and that you can't lead. It's not true. So believe in yourself because we believe in you. And not only are we just going to give lip service to believing in you, we're going to show you that we believe in you by the way that we act, the way that we parent, the way that we nurture you. That's real leadership. But it's leadership that comes because you know you're in a fight. So the challenge that comes from my latest book, Enough, is really a challenge, is a call to arms to all of us, and not just black people, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, to say that, you know what, tell the kids to spit out the sleeping pill. Take off the jackets, kick off the high heels and all the pretensions, and say we've got to get to work in creating new leaders who are about new opportunities, who are about new ideas for this new generation in this new century. It's about time for change. And change is possible if we keep our eyes on the prize. Thank you very much. I get the feeling there may be questions, so. <laughs> but before we have our questions and answers, we have announcements. Today at the City Club, we are listening to a special program featuring Juan Williams, senior national correspondent for National Public Radio and author of Enough, the phony leaders, dead end movements, and culture of failure that are undermining black America and what we can do about it. We will return to our speaker in a minute for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate questions now while we break for a few announcements. Today's program is held in partnership with Policy Bridge and the National Black MBA Association Cleveland Chapter. We would also like to welcome guests at tables hosted by the numerous organizations listed in your program. Thank you for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome to our forum today students who are here as part of our City Club student program. Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from RPM International, Inc. <laughs> With us today are students from Hathaway Brown, John Hay, and John Marshall High Schools. Our student guests have already had the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Williams, and hopefully we'll have a chance to say goodbye before they leave. Also joining us are guests of Policy Bridge, uh, the Barbara Burr Bennett Scholars. We would uh, like to return to our speaker for traditional City Club question and answers. Uh, we welcome questions from everyone, which includes guests. Holding microphones today are City Club Director of Educational Outreach, Elaine Yipe, to my right, and Marketing Director, Missy Toms, to my left. So we'll bring Mr. Williams back up and ask for the first question. Uh, yes, you encourage black leadership coming from the young population. Uh, it's probably well known in this city that uh, young blacks are being harassed by police officers and sometimes are given criminal records. For those who have sort of changed their lives over the years, what do you suggest as far as uh, that's concerned? You mean for young people who have changed their lives, who are back on track? Well, I think getting back on track, by definition, means getting an education in this day and age. Towards the end of the book, Enough, I talk about steps that I think are just so elemental, but essential as well. And that is, of course, first and foremost, to get an education. Get that high school degree. Do not drop out of high school. I don't care if it's the worst high school. Get a real high school diploma. Uh, that is what is absolutely the minimum if you truly want to be competitive in this economy today. But I would encourage you to go on and get more education, get as much education as possible, but do not drop out of high school. Next, I think when you're talking about young people who made mistakes, they've got to realize they've created a deficit for themselves. They've made bad choices. 
Don't then compound that bad choice by thinking you're going to be a rap star, an NBA star, that you're, going to, you're smarter than everybody else, all the adults. Uh, you don't expect to live long. All these kinds of negative images that get put into our young people's minds. Don't buy it. Spit out that pill, that poison, and get on the idea that you'll take a job. You're going to stay in the legitimate job market. It may be that your friends say, hey, that's a, that's a nothing job, man. You're just flipping burgers. You say, you know what? I'm going to do this job very well. I'm going to build a resume. I'm going to build references and recommendations. I'm going to get to know people who can open doors for me. And I'm going to be prepared when those doors are open to step through and to succeed. I also suggest, and this, so much of this is, you know, this is not something I invented. It comes from Census Bureau statistics, that if you delay getting married until you're in your 20s and don't have children until you're married, you're in better position, not only in terms of your own education and professional development, but you're in a better position to be a parent and to help those young people, to nurture them, to give them a stable foundation from which they can grow. If you do those things, there's almost no chance, according to the Census Bureau, that you will live a day in poverty in the United States. Now, given that we have a 25% poverty rate in black America, 12% overall, I think this is good news. These are steps that individuals can take to help themselves. That's great news. I think we should be shouting that from the mountaintop at the start of the new century, talking to people about steps they can take to help themselves, no matter what anybody might be doing. Bill Cosby, when people talk to him about the jail situation, he says they may be building more jails. They may have an industrial prison complex in America. He says they can build all the jails they want. You don't have to go. <laughs> right? So understand there are choices to be made. And we've got to say to our young people, make smart choices. The prison system is not about rehabilitation in this country. So we don't want to get involved. I wouldn't tell my child, oh, yeah, it's just a rite of passage for a young black man to get involved with the prison system. That's making excuses. That's not offering a vision of progress. So once you get beyond the, that kind of you know, negative, stereotypical thing that are being said to our young people, you've got to offer them that positive vision. And you know, here's some basic steps to take. Get yourself an education. Get in the job market. Appreciate the value of marriage and family. Understand that people who get married actually are wealthier. Understand that. Understand that people who are married are, in fact, if they're male, happier. I don't know about the females, but I know the guys are much happier. <laughs> you know, I sometimes, think, I sometimes think that we never say this to our young people, which is why they may, they may you know, watch Married with Children, all these shows. They think marriage is a pain. You know, but somebody's got to say it to them. There's a reason that marriage is such a valued institution. So that's what I would say to those young people as they try to make a change in their life. Good afternoon. I remember you from the days when I was a copy aide at the Washington Post, and I want to express my appreciation to you for being a wonderful role model for those of us who were new and breaking into journalism as African Americans. I have two questions, if I might cheat. Um, first of all, our culture is so, African American culture in my view, is so celebrity driven. It's very difficult to do many of the things that you just outlined. What can we do to redirect our attention to many people who are doing good work, but they're not flashy and flamboyant. They can't sing, they can't dance. Um, but they're doing good work that actually really impacts the policy and the serious issues that affect our country. And then my, my second question no, is... No, I'll do one at a time because I'm, okay. so, I'm so old. Okay. But <laughs> let, me, let me just do... Let me remember the first question. Uh, the, the, the thing I would say is that when you are looking for encouraging real leadership, when you're looking for encouraging young people, what you've got to do is, I think, take advantage of existing leadership and say to them, you know what, these are negative messages that are coming out of your TV. These are negative messages that are being sent to you. And we believe, and this is what I said to you earlier, we believe that you can accomplish, that you have the potential. And the potential is not what is being advertised on TV in gangster rap. It's not what's being said in terms of the lyrics of these songs that talk about all these bitches and hoes. That this is something that is so extreme and so awful. 
we believe that you can achieve and accomplish. So when I'm talking to young people about the kinds of things that I just said there, when you're trying to put people on the right path, you've got to offer them something that's equally as attractive, maybe more attractive. You've got to talk to them about long life, wealth, you know, being able to have children of their own and feel good about it. When you're talking about leadership of that kind, I think you're looking to open doors and open minds. That's what, that's what we're talking about here is looking for opportunities to succeed. And I know that sometimes when you're trying to be a good parent, when you're offering these visions, the young people can say, hey, you're just an old fogey. You don't understand. The beat's great. I love to dance to this music. This is who I am. This is giving voice to my generation. I think you have to say, you know what? This is commercialized. And you're being fooled. You know, Spike Lee had a movie called Bamboozled. You're being bamboozled here. And you have to understand that this is being sold as black people as exotic and erotic and violent and the other in American life. And what you've got to see is there is a tradition of black people working hard, building families, building churches, building as leaders. That is the true tradition. And it's not flashy. It doesn't get the publicity. But that's the reality. That's authentic blackness in America. And then the final point, you said, well, what about the fact that you know, there are lots of real leaders who are not flashy, who aren't running to the TV camera? Well, I think that the challenge for me, for you as journalists, is to recognize those people. But I think the second thing is to understand that it's not about the flash or who gets on the TV. It's about who's doing the work. It's about who is on the ground trying to make a difference in the lives of people. There are lots of people involved in trying to make better schools, job training, employment training, working with people who've been in prison as they come out, working with their families, making sure their children know they don't have to repeat the sins of the father. Those people are doing real work. When I come here and I run into Policy Bridge, when I run into the people from the Black MBA Association, these people are caring about economic development in Cleveland and talking about economic development now being tied into the black community. So you get out of patronage politics and you move on to a new generation of politics that involves black people as strong leaders in the business community here. That's a different relationship. That breaks out of somebody give me a job, let me have a contract, can I get a piece of this? Instead, people say, wait a minute, we got to go over here. This is where new ideas and new energy, new money, new capital is flowing. That, to me, is the kind of thing that we want to acknowledge. I don't know that you need to put it on TV. I don't know that you need to have a great deal of rhetoric surrounding it. It's doing the real work and appreciating people who do real work. And whenever you can, whatever field you're in, supporting those people. Question. How do you see charter schools? Do you see them as an opportunity for African Americans? We've had some, some dismal charter schools here shut down because of fiscal mismanagement that really was a disgrace to our community. These were people from our community leading these schools who just horribly mismanaged the funds. But that aside, is there, is there value in charter schools as you, as you see it? What can we can we take advantage of them? Can well, we just as there's good leadership, there's bad leadership. Just as there's trustworthy leadership, there's leadership that's corrupt. You've got to recognize it for what it is. But the basic issue here is struggling with the problems of public education and people looking for alternatives. How can you create alternatives that would really educate young people in this day and age? So that's why we get into those conversations about charter schools, vouchers, magnet schools that I mentioned earlier. The fact is that if you look at the statistics so far, charter schools have not outperformed public schools. So the question is then, is it a worthwhile adventure? Well, in some cases, there are some specific charter schools that have succeeded. Well, you've got to replicate those, and you've got to move away from the ones that haven't. And I think that you've got to look for ideas, but you don't look for ideas to the point where you invite the corruption that undermines total faith, that people say, you know what, nothing works. And I think that's one, of been, that's one of the big changes in my lifetime in America. It used to be that public schools, public education was, you know, apple pie and motherhood. Now, when you ask Americans about public education, especially in big cities, they say, eh, it really doesn't work. And they know, the kids know it. Kids know that if they don't bring a gun to school, they're not pregnant, not doing drugs, that we give them a diploma. But they also know that when it comes then to going out and competing in the job market, they know, especially if they're the black and Hispanic kids, that they're graduating and getting a diploma, performing only at the eighth grade level. 
and they know that they're at a disadvantage and all this. This speaks to personal security, sense of confidence, attitude towards the world. Plus, you have that victimization mindset being advanced and that negative culture in terms of the hip-hop and all that. It's such a burden on our young people. But once we get them, I think, up to, to snuff in terms of education and high expectations, and it's not being a geek or trying to be different than, better than somebody to strive to be excellent in school, I think we put them in position to succeed. So I don't think that you can whole scale throw out charter schools or throw out vouchers. I know there's a lot of criticism of No Child Left Behind, but I love the idea that schools are finally being held accountable for how they teach black and Hispanic kids. I just love it. I think that makes for people to be innovative about exactly how they go forward with education. So we've got to still be in the business of looking for new ideas, shaking things up, because obviously we're not succeeding. Thank you um, for your work over the years. Um, I'm a pastor and I guess an activist, and I wanted to engage you about the black church. What have you observed over the years, um, its changes, its scope, its challenges, and the possible impact it can have in changing things in our society? Well, I know that if you look at the black church in general these days, the big movement is towards the mega churches. I mean, it's kind of following what's happened with the white churches. And it's moving out. It's uh, you know looking for land out in the suburbs and all the rest. So it's moving away. And sometimes you have a situation where people, especially the middle class, will come back into the inner city to go to church on Sunday, you know, and clog the streets with the cars and the like. But they're not there as role models during the week in terms of making Christ's face and hand evident in that community. My sense is that if Dr. King came back and was talking to us about leadership, he'd have to ask about leadership coming from the pulpit. And I think that if he, you asked him, if he said, well, Dr. King, you know, something like AIDS comes along, you would think that that would have been a moment of conscience in which the black church would have been at the forefront. But in fact, it's been in the back because we've been so uptight about the sexual nature of the disease and people are very uncomfortable about gays anyway, much less, you know, transmission between men and women, not quite there. And if you look at the, I know in my congregation, you don't see that many young people used to be that young people found the church much more relevant, much more challenging, engaging, in terms of even creating a sense of community. I think the mega churches do better than that just because they're so large, they can even break, break out into youth churches. But overall, you'd have to say young people are not reacting to the church as the tremendous asset that it is in the black community at the moment. And I think the reason for that is the church is not taking risk in terms of speaking to the social issues in the way that they could. The church is just so important. It is, to my mind, in terms of the political leadership in the country, but also because they have so much wealth. Don't forget the wealth in the black church. They have so much wealth. They could be real leaders in terms of business opportunities. You look at Floyd Flake, who runs the biggest black church in New York City. He's already engaged in housing. He's engaged in starting schools. He's making the church a seed. You know, you know the parable of the talents. I mean, he's taking his talent and expanding it, and expanding it in terms of not only education but wealth, and building opportunities for other leaders then to perform in the political arena as well. That to me is what we've got to do with the black church in this generation. Hi, my name is Lindsey Craig. I'm a Barbara Bird Bennett Scholar, and I go to Martin Luther King HCC. Um, right now, with our senior class, we're having a problem trying to get our class leadership to connect with the officials of our school and of other places that could help us fund our, fund our class and connect back with our students. Is there any suggestions that you have for us to help us out? I don't quite understand. You're having trouble connecting with the... Our, our class leadership, our class president is having a problem connecting the people to the officials to try and get the help. Officials in the school? Officials in the school and officials outside who could help fund our class. Right now we're having problems raising money and even getting our class to unite. Even getting the class to unite. And, but you know what you got to tell me, and maybe this is what you got to tell the officials is, money for what? What do you want to do with that money? We're just trying to have money to fund our class as far as our, our prom and some of the basic things that we even need to like, help support our classes. Because right now, we don't have really any money raised to help to do anything, to even give to our next, the next year that's coming up, 08 or 09. We have nothing raised and nothing gathered because we can't unite. <laughs> 
Well, I think you've got to get the young people together and start talking about exactly how you could do something so innovative and different, something that would break out, get attention, uh, and maybe what you've got to do is do it in such a way that it would be positioned to have a direct appeal to people in the school administration or people in a neighborhood business or people in a neighborhood church, people who have those kind of resources to say,